Can I ask you a quick question? Hi, I just can't see anything on my on my video at all. Hmm. I can't see you at all. You can see me though? That is so strange. It's just a black screen. Yeah, yeah. Let's quickly see if we can restart. Thank you. We're having some minor technical difficulties. The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. So I think we're going to, there we go. Are you there? I am. Can you see me now? I can't, but it's okay. Right. No worries about it. I just won't be able to see the video. Oh, there we go. Oh, it's coming to black. Ah, oh, there we go. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Technical issues resolved. That's we have right. we have a couple in every single interview. That's Luckily, fine. this time it's nothing drastic. <laughs> um. So now that you can see me. Mm -hmm. um, let's actually, before I get into the questions about your choreographic experience specifically, uh, where did you start your career in dance? Can you tell us a little bit about kind of your background? My career or just, ba or my general, I'll just give Your general, like the, the general backstory. Sure. I'll keep it quick. Um, I was born in South Africa and was trained by, when I was little, by two of my favorite people in the world, Felicity and Barbara, Barbara Chernan, who was my first ballet teacher, and then went on to do my high school training at National School of the Arts, which is our art school in Johannesburg. And then after that, I uh, received a scholarship to go to Ron Bear Ballet and Contemporary School, and then that scholarship was transferred to the Royal Ballet School, where I finished. Um, training and then went to Boston Ballet. I started with BB2 and then went to Netherlands Dance, the, uh, Netherlands Dance Theater 2 and then 1. That's a kind of crazy tra trajectory there. Yeah. Um, so how did you end up making the transition from Boston Ballet to to go to NDT2? Um, I had Prior to auditioning for Boston Ballet, when I was still living in London and training, I'd actually aud I'd auditioned for NDT2 once before and didn't get through to getting a job, but got through to kind of the final round, which um, when I returned to school in London, my director said, you know, that's a great thing. you got to hold on to that. Like, they, they you, you know, you probably probably be remembered, which I was, um, yeah, not convinced of. But it's hard to imagine being remembered <laughs> by such a large company. Yeah, and you're so young, and there's a million people there. But I mean, it's nice. I was I was green, but I it felt good. And then I I, I was in the back of my mind always, but I don't think I really ever thought I'd pursue it again that soon again. It was only a couple of years that I tried it again, um, mm. because Jorma Ello had come over from Netherlands Dance Theater to choreograph his first piece on Boston Ballet. And um, I was very fortunate at the time that I was given one of the solo, the lead roles to do, which was pretty unusual for a BB2 person to be cast like that. Um, so 
just having experience work with him and and just loving contemporary dance a lot. I was always fiddling on the side and choreographing myself and being involved with a million projects that I started up with other dancers in the company. So I think that, I mean, it was a, it was already a huge blossoming thing for me. I'd always wanted to be in the company, but I liked classical and would have stayed. But Yorma um, convinced me, he was like, you just really need to audition right now. I think this is a good time for you. And so I took his advice and I flew over there for a weekend and I stayed with him and then I got the job, which is great. It's an awesome, an awesome story. So where in that time span did you begin to choreograph? What was the kind of starting off point? I have been choreographing forever, honestly. Like I, even in South Africa, I choreographed constantly. I had a group of friends who were very interested in it and also a group of female friends who were very interested in it. My best friend loved to do it. A lot of my girls in my class liked to do it. It was very common, I think, just the, the way I grew up there and the sort of turbulent political situation and the and the energy it, it was South Africa was so cool that way I there was never any cap on whether it was a male or female thing to do we just all did it we all participated in competitions and festivals and it was just encouraged always it was never a thing that you didn't do and I had a bug for it from very young maybe five or six already I was constantly making up stuff and so then I would enter into competitions with friends and make up duets on myself and my friend and then eventually I started doing bigger group stuff but I also was in the rhythmic gymnastics I was on the national team for rhythmic gymnastics mm -hmm. and make up my solos a lot which was fun like that was a nice outlet for that but it's all it's been a consistent thing even in, in Boston um my principal dancer friends at the time Yuri and Viktor Plotnikov and a couple of us, like we banded together and we formed something called Raw Dance, which is, I think this, I think they still call it Raw Dance. I don't know, but it was the first outlet for company choreographers to work. And I was, I did that every year. And I think I was the only girl actually doing that at the time with them. Um, but I make solos on myself to go to Jackson and it's been consistent. So it's not a, it's not it, a it's new not thing. It's not something that all of a sudden started and trying to rope people into doing my doing my stuff with me mm -hmm. so you, uh when you were in south africa did you have were there a lot of opportunities to do choreographic competitions and that sort of stuff was that a widely accessible thing yes yeah i don't know why the climate was as such but it was i don't remember it was just a very flourishing art scene and i think because there was so much political change happening it it there was just, an, there's always an energy in Africa that's kind of inherent, but there is something about finding your voice and getting out there. And also because you feel so far removed from the European world or the American world, I think there's this, this need to express yourself and figure yourself out and learn and grab onto whatever and put together things. You're just constantly working. Mm -hmm. um, I really remember all of my dance time being like that. And if you weren't working in school breaks or after school or putting something together or designing costumes for somebody else's piece, or it was just, it was, the outlets were there. And if they weren't, we made them available to ourselves. We would create projects to do. And they, there were quite a lot of things going on. Johannesburg is a big city. So there was, mm -hmm. you know, there was a pretty vibrant art scene going on, especially even for schools. Gotcha. So as you eventually went through to your career, what were some of your favorite choreographic processes? Or were there some choreographic processes while you're in South Africa that you really enjoyed? Um, that's a really good question, actually. And I think because in company life, it's different as you're, you're both in your artistic freedom trying to express yourself and grow, but you're also trying to maintain your job. Like there's a certain mm -hmm. amount of like, anxiety that goes with the whole thing. I think the process of choreographing with people prior to getting a job, particularly in London, I actually remember in Rombert, that was exceptionally fun and fulfilling just because you didn't have a- There wasn't um, a stress level involved. Right, of course. You're literally just trying to be your utmost weirdest self. And that's that's, the joy of it. it there was no, there were no boundaries and there was no deep end you know it was just go for it mm -hmm. and so and I had a lot of friends that were from South Africa in the 
school as well. My friend Tabiso and I, we, we joined together to do something with Central St. Martin School of Design. And so we got to do something in a theater together and have, you know, the university design stuff for us. But so again, creating opportunities for yourselves. Yeah, I think that's so much fun. I, I enjoy that. I enjoy the like barren landscape that you can then create something out of nothing. And it, it's really exciting. But process with other people, I mean, nothing could... I, I, I've had such wonderful process looking at choreographers, maybe not being choreographed on, like just watching Stanton Walsh's process in in um, Boston and Yorma was amazing. Mm-hmm. Amazing to have been picked out so young and been literally being created on and being valued what, what my input was, you know, valued was cool. Um, and that, having that exposure to that, to that um, vocabulary. But NDT, of course, is just something of it in it a different realm yeah. and that realm is something I can't really put into words other than it's not what you're doing it's the how you're doing it and it's the how you're exploring it and it's I think it takes a lot more it's just like being in a scientific laboratory with a bunch of geniuses that all have the same work ethic and interest and craziness and then you get to have the time to let things bubble so a li- you know, just the saturation is different. And so uh, it's pretty wild and it's, it's deep. That's the only way I can explain it. So you mentioned getting to kind of be your weirdest self and experience that when you're choreographing on Friends in London. Would you say that you have a specific appreciation for oddity in choreography? I do. I've always, I like quirky a lot, actually. I've been, my stuff has been explained as quirky before, but I think I've become less quirky lately. Um, oddity is great. Like, who wants boring? I mean, that's yeah. just a cri- crime to the art world. And your oddity is so specific to you, you may as well explore it because yeah. nobody <laughs> have that. And you also don't know what it is. I think just going through what, whatever it is that interests you, whether it's humor or you know, just strange, strange relationships between between people. I mean, it doesn't, it's always, dance is so beautiful, it's not going to not be beautiful, but I think, yeah, oddity is valuable. I had an interesting thought as I was watching some of the videos you sent me earlier, and that is that dance is kind of, in a way, an opportunity to subvert the audience's expectations in a way that is number one enjoyable and or or not enjoyable depending on your objective and satisfying Mm -hmm. that if you if you were to look at something like game of thrones they subvert your expectation in a way that is consistently disappointing and frustrating (laughs) yes i guess so yeah but I, I think dance very much does the opposite of that in that when you see something that is unexpected and interesting, there is a, a great interest and appreciation for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we're, you know, we're theater goers, so we know these things intricately. We watch stuff online and we, you and I are, and a lot of the dance audience is very um, uh, educated, but I think for somebody who's not educated in dance, it's it's wonderful also to see something that's strange and and I would say is like exposing a side of humanity we don't normally do, particularly yeah. TV. You know, things are it's because it's raw and it's and it's also in the moment and it's live theater and it's unexpected and it it kind of takes your breath away in strange ways that you you are seeing a mirror of yourself and you're also exposed to something else that you would not normally get to see mm-hmm. and i don't know what that is about dance it's just so visceral it's very it's the bodies it's the bodies themselves are strange and it's like it's it's wonderful when they're strange too yeah and beautiful. I think it stretches your imagination of what humanity is capable of. I think that's the biggest thing that dance does. Totally. Because not only is it uh, physically so demanding and hard to imagine yourself doing if you aren't a dancer, um, it's also 
there's an element of recognition that with exceptional work, you're capable of doing all kinds of incredible things. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there's a recognition maybe too that, I mean, that the body itself, I, there's just such um, appreciation for how finite that time is that a body could do that. And also such um, amazement for people who don't dance, just to see a body do those things mm -hmm. and then be moved by that. I think, I think the, the skill level in and of itself is already something that's just so captivating. And then on top of that, you're experiencing humanity and on an emotional and cerebral level. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your choreographic process to somebody else? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I laugh because one of the ballet mistresses recently that I worked with was like, you are absolute organized chaos, but it really works. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not chaotic in my mind. I think I have a way of... Um, I don't disclose a lot of information, which I'm starting to feel I'm not, I'm not sure how I want to deal with that going forward. I think maybe more information could be better given mm. a, a group of dancers that I trust. I would, I want to explore more with them, which I have recently with a smaller group, actually. Um, I think a lot of the process I have is just being very aware of the people that are in front of me, very responsive to the people, investing in them and not having too much planned. I have a plan overall, but the best part about it is you're working with other extremely talented people who have a voice too. So I think the collaboration process for me, I would say that's my, it's collaborative. And then pulling that collaboration in the way that I feel I wanna express it. Mm -hmm. So kind of taking your own ideas, working with the dancers and then utilizing how they fit into those concepts and stretching it into what eventually ends up becoming the final product. Yeah. And I think not even, you know, the concept itself can also, concepts are malleable as well. I mean, you can have an overriding concept that then you're sort of sparked by somebody else's feelings about it that also can take you a little bit on a tangent that you didn't you weren't even thinking before either. I, I try not to fit people. I try not to fit people into molds that doesn't work for me. I would rather give paint and and we splash it out together and then edit. Mm -hmm. And and bodies are so specific. And I do try to grow dancers as best as I can. It's like that sounds really um arrogant or I don't know. Just the, but I I do want to. I don't think so. I, I don't think that sounds arrogant at all because. <laughs> Looking at that as a goal, I think that's a fantastic opportunity for most dancers because most dancers don't feel that they get those opportunities often. And particularly here in the States, I think where the creative processes are quick. So I think there's certain, some things that I, there's like a distillation of certain ideas that I try to implant pretty quickly just so that, you know, your the the quality is is something that, is otherworldly and and can help them also with their technique too. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, that the process in the United States of creation is usually pretty quick. Uh, how does it compare to other places? Because I actually hadn't heard that before. I think generally it's a little shorter here. I, I would be curious to know. I haven't worked in Europe recently, so I don't, I'm not sure how long it You don't those... know how it's evolved recently. Yeah, it depends on the length of the piece and um, whether it's a full length or half an hour piece or, you know, what you're, or how many dancers, for instance. But in from my experience dancing in Holland, I I remember our process being longer. Mm -hmm. um, but also it's longer and repeated. The amount of times that you get to, experience yourself in that piece and be on stage is it's it's um it's enough time that it's more time than i think is what afford is afforded here in the states unless you're in a rep company repeating things a lot mm -hmm. 
so since we have limited time, going to get to kind of the, the deep questions rather quickly. And I don't know if we'll actually have time to review video and talk about video much since we're on a little bit shortened time frame. It's all right. We'll keep going. I'll, 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 I'll do my best to keep things. So seeing okay. the intense anger and frustration in people of color as a community, do you feel yes. an obligation to respond to what is happening at present in your choreography? Yes, I think. But uh, I think it's on on many levels, though, and it's something I felt actually really strongly about as well. I've has been re I've been reading friends of mine posts of well known choreographers and actors and people. I I think the first number one thing to do is to not culturally appropriate other cultures. I think that's a really difficult thing that we deal with in the arts world. And, you know, I'm hesitant to say that not to whitewash ideas, you know, quote unquote, usurping or stealing ideas from other cultures and then trying to tra translate them in a way that just is not authentic. It doesn't pay homage to the people and it doesn't, it's not my story to tell. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that goes on and probably going on less, but I'm really weary of that. And I I have projects actually in my pockets at the moment that I have to reconsider and look at and be clear about how I want to be representing them and who I want to be working with and collaborating so that it, it isn't some white girl talking about a story that's not hers to tell. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, it's so important. Um, there's so much cultural appropriation. We don't even realize it. And I, I have really dear friends of mine, African-American friends of mine, Trinidadian friends of mine, black South African friends of mine, that we, we chat a lot about this sort of thing. And um, I think that, that that for me is a big deal. So that's, but that's almost coming on the beware side as opposed to proactive side. It's like, just let's look at what we're talking about and, and maybe broaden our scopes of what we wanna talk about. And then when we wanna talk about other stories that aren't asked to tell, you better be working with the right people. Mm -hmm with the correct culturally appropriate people who know what their story is and rep be represented and they have to be represented. So that's, that's what I feel is a change I can make. Yeah. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about what we can do as artists and I'm kind of at a loss specifically for feeling like it's not my story to tell. Like I, I would love to create something that feels authentic uh, and that speaks to the current problems of our world mm -hmm. but it's challenging to talk about something that while while I sympathize and empathize I I only understand what I can see and without having that deeper understanding from actually experiencing it personally, how do I approach creating something at all? Like I'm, I'm feeling deeply at a loss at, at how to create something that uh, adequately di displays how I feel while not being derivative. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think how you feel about something is ever going to be derivative because <clears throat> you are only you with your point of view, you know, how, how <clears throat> you're allowed a voice, you have a voice, you can talk from your point of view. I think it's just, <clears throat> excuse me, I think what one wants to talk about has to be really be carefully explored though and and not be trite and not ignore if you're going to tackle a subject you you know do your research yeah and understand what viewpoint you are taking and what 
and why? Why talk about it? What does it do for you and what does it do for anybody else if you really are going to take on something like that? I mean, not not all art is political, but I think all art is political. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that. That's, that's the classic Nina Simone. Like you have to, you are reflecting your times and you're allowed to join the voice. I mean, that's, that's what we want right now. We want yeah. everybody talking about this. That is the bloody point too, you know? Everyone has to bend together and talk about this. That's how, that's the way we Yeah, it has to be a larger conversation. Yeah. I think it's just, in dance, it's quite difficult. Um, it's difficult for a couple of reasons. I think also just because I don't think our Black community is represented in dance enough. And I agree. And that there just needs to be more of that, honestly. More more clear representation and and just listening and making other stories available to listen to but i know what you mean and i think that that's i think it's a i don't think it's a bad time to just reflect on that i don't think you need to have an answer right now to that you know i think that's part of what listening is right now is listening and then processing processing what what that shift is in you that's how i feel i'm not yeah I yeah I, I i totally agree with you 100 percent on everything you said to this point um what are what are the small decisions that lead to a piece being impactful and adequate in conversation about a subject because i think dance really can be hugely conversational with yeah. an audience it's pretty amazing actually yes small details impact mm. i think well overall back to the quality of work i think quality always speaks and i think that's a because when the quality is good it attracts people to watch and listen more and you can't deny quality it's sort of something that's intrinsic people know it when they see it um and you could even you can't even explain that to a lay person but i think when they see quality dance it's it is just like <gasps> it takes your breath away and something else yeah. you're you've gone into the back of your head you don't have to you're not looking for anything else other than what you're feeling and just kind of have a layer down but so that's not a small aspect quality, but I think that's what we as dancers are looking for in our bodies. Um, but choreographically, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know, that's a really hard question. I don't think there are small details as much as- There yeah, are the, hard the details. Has to, has to, has to be, brilliant why do it if you're not going to do it beautifully and brilliant and sew up all the edges unless it's your real aim to not you know the, whatever exposition you're doing is cool um and invest in your in your dancers in your humans that you have i mean that's for me the the small detail is not to just paint over people um and transitions i like to if we have to talk technically just like figuring out transitions that's always important are there any transitions that you have a tendency to avoid that you find particularly uninspiring that's so funny you asked that it's actually a question i thought of a while ago and i think i may have asked it before in an interview but since you brought it up it seems like such a fitting question i god I mean, <laughs> I don't want the world to break on stage. I want it to be some sort of continue, even if it's a, a harsh reality or, or punch in your face reality, whatever that is that is going on choreographically or, or mm -hmm. theatrically. I think uh, transitions to, to keep it intact so that you're, you don't give your audience a moment to um, steep back into reality. They have the, to keep them in, engaged in it, so that from beginning to end, they've they've gone into this bizarre or fantastic or beautiful trip. So, lighting wise, music transition wise, I mean, 
just the aesthetic of the stage, I think, particularly for concert dance, has to be in has to be great, beautiful, uh, stark, whatever it is. Enough that you have an escapist reality that that you're not looking at tape marks on the Marley and you know. Mm-hmm. That's sort of an obvious thing, but I think so, that happens so trying a lot to avoid those moments that can pull you out of the piece. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know if that's necessarily choreographically, but that's also keeping people intact, like keeping people connected on stage and giving them purpose on stage. If if you don't have, if not everyone is there for a reason, then they don't need to be there. And if they are there for a reason, it's investing why and having the connections between the humans make sense. Mm. And that take, I mean, I'm not saying I do that all the time. It, I try my best. It's a challenge. It's something to it's strive for. Yeah, it's to, I think the greatest tool is editing. So, yeah. Yeah. Editing yeah, can be a challenge in a short production span. So how do you handle editing yeah. when you don't have much time? Oh my gosh, with difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I am such I guess like I get I fall in love with all my dancers so much and I and I I hate taking people out of things or I feel such a personal affront when you've gone through a process and you're like all right I'll five you we're not on this section anymore now you know there's that that decision the personal is, pain in it's rough kind of it's decision. rough yeah so I think just with difficulty and I think it often ends up being that kind of a thing where you've created a section for a bunch of dancers or a, a, a section that completely needs to be cut that's just not necessary and it doesn't serve the piece and so mm-hmm. there is still a process there everybody's learned a lot and they know for the greater good it's better it just sucks to, to actually like look at something and scratch it but yeah. it comes up later again or it comes up in a, in a much better way later again sometimes with those same dancers so you're always your material is always just chewing you know mm-hmm. that, that's a that's a beautiful thing and as choreographer as a choreographer, you have the opportunity to take information that you've learned from a process and then recycle it if you don't end up using it directly on oh my God. the current piece. Yeah. Constantly. You're constantly recycling. I mean, you are you, and you're recycling and improving and delving into your your conversation that you're having and using your whatever it is that you're exploring. I mean... I, I quite like theatrical stuff. I don't know if I sent you much of that stuff. I've done a little bit more theatrical stuff recently and also Santa Barbara Dance Theater. But like that that part of it too is a challenge in really creating storyline. I, I love that. Do you have a strong preference for telling stories or narratives? I don't have a preference for it, but I think I I end up doing it regardless. Like even in the abstract pieces that I've done, there there's some kind of through there's some, line that there's a through it. line yeah and i usually it's not that i don't know what it is i know what i'm i know what i'm trying to express in it but um yeah that that's sort of i think that's already that's coming through whether i like it or not but i do enjoy i enjoy storylines a lot i've had a lot more opportunities in global ballet to do that and um coming up with new zealand there'll be some opportunities for that so that that is I went to acting school for a number of years and I really, I enjoy the arc of storytelling so much. I really enjoy character. So given a budget of any size, so you have all the resources you need to create your dream project. What does that project look like? What is, what is the thing that you're working on? Oh my God, what a question. So this is actually a question that I plan on asking every choreographer as I go through these interviews. Because it it's interesting to see the broad scope of what we can imagine. Mm-hmm. And I think it's an important question to ask. Like, what's the biggest thing you can think of creating? Like, if, if you were given the opportunity to just do something and they said, make anything, Go nuts. Well, that like, happens a lot. I mean, that that's not a far cry from how some of the commissions happen. Yeah. Um, I think musically, that would be... 
God, there are so many musicians that I would just absolutely love to work with and have full entire pieces created for classical musicians, um, Radiohead, you name it. I mean, there would be, you know, mm -hmm. there's a, That's really a hard question. One of the theater designers I desperately want to work with in my lifetime is Bob Wilson. Um, and then my brother's also a set designer. So for me to have a project where those three people could be involved um, <clears throat> and set, yeah, set is, I would love a production in the round, kind of like what Ian B does with when they have their Swan Lake and their Alice, <clears throat> with their Cinderella. <clears throat> um, Having dancing and... around sounds so interesting to me, and it's something I've thought about doing personally, but there's not yeah. much opportunity to perform in the round in the United States. No, there isn't. There's small venues, but nothing large. Yeah, there there's <clears throat> a small venue in Austin that seats maybe 400 people that I know of. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, I've maybe I've seen one production in the round where literally they put seating up on a stage, and then uh, just had this small stage kind of centered on mm -hmm. the stage so that they could fully light it. But I haven't seen anything on a broader scale in the United States at all. I don't think I have either. I'm trying to think if I have and I, not, nothing large like that. I mean, it's it's expensive, and I don't know if what ticket sales would be like for something like that. But it, yeah, the performances we have in Europe like that are unbelievable, beautiful, and outdoors is beautiful too. Um, I do have a project right now that I'm working with with Louisville Ballet. And it's funny because, like you said, like doing anything and any your dream project, absolutely. There's I have a lot of ideas, and there's plenty of musicians that I love to work with, especially female musicians. This woman who just um, composed for The Joker, who won the Academy Award, who oh, yeah. killed it for Godna de Tier. She's fantastic. I mean, there's, you know, there's... Um, I, oh, God, I'm just... I would love an original, full-length, full orchestration done um and there's a lot of young composers at the moment that i would be interested in who i'm not going to say all of them because i don't want to give away my secrets on my projects <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah a wish list definitely also of like more females that for me is a big deal mm -hmm. and um and working with my brother because he's fantastic but story-wise, you know, I, I've got a couple of different storylines up my, up my sleeve of things I'd like to do and, and full lengths. I don't really want to divulge. Things that you're going to keep close until it yeah. actually gets to happen. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, that's... At the moment, though, I will say I am working on a project called The Great Bear with Louisville Ballet. Mm -hmm. And um, that's been a couple of years in the making. And it's been one of those projects that have been kicked around into different corners and not... It, it, been on the season but not been on the season various financial you know restrictions due to what's happened now and so now I kind of have I do have kind of a dream project that I'm sitting with in my hand right now and have to be very careful about how to put music to I, I'm a big fan of um, Mason Bates who's a composer in Canada and we've used some of his music for a trial we did in England Mm -hmm. in a small black box theater, just like 200 people, and they had four performances there. And so that'll grow into something big that I see in a big park in the round underneath the stars. It's a story about the constellation. So, that you know. That so awesome. That's totally it, something I could see in, like, the uh, the Central Park summer season. Yeah, exactly. In, like, New York. That would be so cool. It would be so fitting. Absolutely. That's... And right now, I think, you know, Especially, well, we'll see what happens with theaters, but I think the moment to get people all back together again under under the sky would be really, that's 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 the dream, getting people back into the theater right now. Yeah, the moment of, like, people actually being able to feel community again is going yep. to be absolutely insane. Yes. Like, getting to feel that sense of community without fear of something that's, invisible to us 
that's right. created this social barrier between us so easily. Um, I know, and, and and that's it. It has. It's huge. I hope that there is a newfound appreciation for being together and watching live performance. I, I think so. I think very much so. Like experiencing things as a collective, I think is is one of the things that I miss the most right now. Like collective human experience is something that we kind of take for granted often. Yeah. Um, I hate sitting on my computer this much. I've, I'm spending so much time just trying to get in contact with people, emailing people, um, asking for interviews, trying to keep myself busy, doing stuff like that, watching movies, anything to kind of just like keep myself entertained and pacified until this passes. Um, you're doing a good job. I mean, <laughs> it's really, I mean, it is, and you're reaching a broad audience like this. It is exciting. Like, I hope it does do what, what the internet could be so good for and is good for on mm -hmm. a lot of times. You know, finding new audience and and reaching, getting dance out there more. I mean, this is amazing what you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's kind of it's a beautiful time to explore that. So that's it's great. And I think this is a project that I plan on continuing well after this is over. Um, I'm really enjoying the process, and it's it's affording me an opportunity to understand a lot more of the current artistic landscape. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's doing the same for a lot of the dancers that are watching these interviews. And for a general audience that maybe doesn't understand what the choreographic process looks like all the time and kind of how personal that can be, for the people creating and being a part of it. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, as much as this is a job, we're, we're all kind of living a dream every day, getting to create something new and interesting and, I mean, have those big dreams about a piece we might get to create and then one day actually getting to pursue that. I mean, it happens all the time yeah. in our careers getting the opportunities to actually pursue something that we feel desperately passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the ultimate beauty of this career. Yep. It Whether is. you're a dancer and or choreographer at, at any position within the dance world. We are lucky. I hope that we get to go back to what we do. But we also have a duty to shed light on issues in our world. And that's, that is an artist's, mm -hmm. you know, that your point of view is valid. And that's what, that's what hopefully we all get back together soon to start doing that. There's so much, there's so much going on in the world now. I think like there's going to be some sort of renewed energy and, um, I don't know, gratitude. So just to wrap this interview up, since I know you're on a, a tight time schedule, what's next for you? What, what do you hope to be working on shortly? Or is there something that you're going to be able to work on as we wait out the remainder of COVID-19? Right now, I have um, a project where I would have been in Royal New I would have been at Royal New Zealand Valley creating a new piece. Um, and restaging an old one. Um, and that obviously was canceled. And um, the director there, Patricia Barker, is um, formidable and awesome. And so she's gone ahead and actually restructured their season in a way that everybody's still involved differently, but involved. And so um, they, they're they actually restaging a piece I did for Cincinnati Ballet last year. And I'll be doing some Zoom rehearsals. Um, I've had a couple. Um, How's that already. process been for you? Well, it's just started, so we're it's it's an it's early days, but I'll get back to you about that. But it's <laughs> it's hard. I mean, that's hard on the it's a it's not satisfying in the same way, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm grateful. I'm so grateful to connect with them all the way in Wellington. I mean, it's it's awesome. And Laura um, Schultz who is the ballet mistress there I've worked with a lot over the years. She used to be in Grand Rapids actually too, and she's brilliant. So, mm -hmm. you know, when your ballet is in good hands, that's all that 
you, you know, it's going to be fine. So they, they understand the aesthetic. Um, and they're great. They're a great group. So that's cool. That's coming up. And then I'm in Louisville right now. So I actually have some stuff I'm working on and planning because their season will start and it'll be an, an adjusted version of what they were doing but there there is something coming up that's going to be exciting so i have are, actually, are they actually going to be able to do a performance in theaters at all or do they know yet um at the moment i'm going to wait for robert curran the director to make his announcement about what they're doing i'm not really privy to say what they're up to because they haven't had their announcement but mm -hmm. i think i think definitely an altered season i don't think we have the um well, I guess just the safety that New Zealand has right now. They're back in the studios and working together, yeah, but they have no a, new cases, you know, so it's a, it's a little bit of a different story over there. Yeah, they're in uh, an advantageous position in terms of uh, their relative situation. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, like, every director here is, you know, scratching their heads and trying to figure out... Still what kind of feeling it out viable like how do we keep the dancers employed they all have you know they feel responsible for their dancers too so there is there is a way i mean this is what we do like in times of crises arts prevails that's that's yeah. the whole point of us we have to we have to <laughs> we, we have to adapt and change and continue to make things exist absolutely, absolutely. without art it's pointless yeah and sometimes restrictions come out with the most awesome things i mean that's not not atypical so knowing that you have uh, a good amount of experience working on film projects is that something that you've considered for the near future i would love to do that i think it's very hard to work on real film real i say quote unquote like hollywood movies and such um being outside of la because it is kind of one of those meet and greet worlds if you just you run into That's the, the right community. people. Here, and... you, talk, no, 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 things are, oh, no, no, no. you know, it's a, it's a, it's based kind of on being there a lot and also being available really quickly because those things go down a lot faster than in the concert world. You'll get a call and they're like, we're going to start next week. And, you know, your planner for your concert dance world is different. Yeah. And so I, at the moment I haven't made those opportunities available to, available to myself entirely now just because I'm not there and also, some of those things are on hold with projects I was um, previously involved in. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I would love to do that. Film's awesome, and we can do a lot on film. I think there's, I think that's what's coming out now too, is how to make dance on film work without saturating it. Without, you know, it's hard to watch dance on film sometimes so much. I'm sure you've experienced that too. Like where it's you know, so it's overdone and overexposed and shot from. 12 different angles from a multitude of cameras that are all at different exposures and yeah yeah i mean my thought process is if you have to chop up dance that much then maybe you should have been more thoughtful to begin with but you know like, that's your tweet that's your tweet after this yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've actually been brainstorming ideas to try to to work around that, and I think that's kind of the next step in terms of being creative, at least for now, is is figuring out a process by which we can adequately film dance. Yeah, um, I think that that's going to be a challenge for a lot of people coming up now. It's a good challenge. We yeah. have all we have the technique, you know, the technique for it, and the capabilities for it why not mm -hmm. i mean i i feel like choreographers think so much um from like a, a framing perspective already that putting things on film for a choreographer might already make sense to a large extent so long as you can imagine uh, a different perspective yes so I, I don't I don't think it's impossible, and I think we already largely have the skill set. I think it's just it's something that we haven't explored as much. And it costs. It's a, it's not a it's not a cheap endeavor. So I think it's finding a way if you're really going to do a sustainable version of that. I mean, for people to fundraise for films is always the problem. You know, that's yeah. it's very expensive to have a DP to have all your cameramen to have 
everything ready, the lights up. It's it's a lot. So I think yeah. investing in that in lieu of investing in sets or designs in the theater or, you know, rogue projects that go on and we really just plug our money into that for the next yeah. year. Who knows? I think I, my that, thought process is theaters aren't being used anyway. So what if we can use theaters as film sets in very much the same way that they're used in the some of the videos you sent me you I know mean, why I not think utilize the, theaters for the lighting and for the opportunities they give maybe not so much for the audience they provide absolutely i think just in the states that we're not really um uh lucky enough for most ballet companies to have their own theater without renting so mm -hmm. a lot of those rentals are really exorbitant costs that i think only bums on seats are recouping so you know that part of it is figuring out well what what the theaters are also aren't are getting filled either them. so it's maybe that a project like that could be mutually beneficial and at a lower cost than it would be usually yeah i think those are all the avenues people have, are going to be talking about a lot so yeah, it's, it's figuring out how to allocate resources and maybe help the theaters as well. Yeah. By giving at least some kind of use for the space. Yeah. I miss the theater. I'm sure you do too. Yeah. I think everybody, it's going to be a very beautiful moment when we're back. Uh, yeah. I mean, right now, I think my, my best guess would be getting back into the theater for Nutcracker. Like, I don't know, like maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe we'll be able to get back into the theater earlier. I have no idea. I'm, I'm not some kind of expert, but I, I can imagine like for the, for the first time in a while being like, yes, Nutcracker's here and we're going to be in the theater for a month. Like. Right. Of all the times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that I, moment of dread is just pure sweetness now. Yep. Yeah. I, I can imagine it being exactly like that. That's funny. But thank you so much for coming on for the interview today. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. I feel like I waxed on a couple of tangents there, but just overall, I mean, yeah, missing dancing, missing being with dancers in the studio. So yeah. hopefully we all see each other soon. We'll, we'll get back to that. As, yeah. soon, as soon as humanly possible, we will get back to that because I think it's what we all miss most. Yeah. But it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you for doing this. Too. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. Talk to you soon. Bye.